Reading comes from Eckhart Tolle. The dark night of the soul is a kind of death. What dies is the egoic sense of self. Of course, death is always painful, but nothing real has actually died there, only an illusory identity. Now it is probably the case that some people who've experienced this transformation realize that they had to go through that in order to bring about a spiritual awakening. Often it is part of the awakening process, the death of the old self and the birth of the true self. It's the collapse of a mind-made meaning, a conceptual meaning of life, believing that you understand what it's all about. You wipe the board clean. So if you will, please take a moment with me to silently contemplate these words. And so, centered here and now, I recognize the presence of spirit flowing through this moment, expressing as each person present, I see clearly the divine shining brightly throughout this service. I know all is exactly as it should be. Nothing is amiss. And I give thanks. Thank you for Reverend Cece and her message. Thank you for the presence of everyone here today. Thank you for the bright light that is this, God's life. And so it is. So I um, came up with that reading like before I went to this fabulous retreat. <laughs> And now the talk's totally different, so forgive me for that. <laughs> I just got back from a uh, Quaker retreat, actually, uh, from the center through the Center for Courage and Renewal, and it was a retreat for clergy of all stripes, and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It was one of those places where my soul gets renewed, you know, and so I, I am in a totally different space than I was when I left. So. So I read something yesterday by Sakyong Mipham, who is the lineage holder of the Shambhala tradition of Buddhism. He said, throughout history, the deepest minds have come to the conclusion that there is something profoundly worthy about being human. Something profoundly worthy about being human. Something that, that he calls basic goodness. And I love that line because that's what we're here to examine. That's what we've been exploring is this basic goodness and how we can touch it within ourselves through the lens of these seven sacred truths of spiritual power. All is one, honor one another, honor oneself, the divine power of love, following the divine will or the divine life that lives within us, seeking only truth and living in the present moment. And we've talked about how to use these truths as guideposts for our lives. The result, as I think about Eckhart Tolle's discussion of the dark night of the soul, and then a rebirth, the, the result, the rebirth does not have to be the result of a dark night of the soul. It often is, but it can also be from, from, it can also arise from following these guideposts, from really living from that spiritual power that we're all born with. What I call divine rebirth happens when we start to live differently as a result of opening ourselves to the inner divine. We die to an old way of being, that, that mind-made existence that he mentioned, an old way of being that's fearful, self-centered, resentful, unforgiving, lonely, self-deprecating, self-loathing in some cases, and we're reborn into uh, a truer self. We're reborn into an innate sense of our own 
worthiness and the end and and basic goodness we become aware of ourselves as powerful and beautiful and beloved as loving manifestations of the one life of the universe so I was thinking about and meditating on these seven truths and we've been talking about living from them and, and I think they bring us to a point of rebirth they bring us to a point of awareness that doesn't let us go back into our old ways of being you know we get we 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 are born and then reborn as even more of what we came here to be as even more fully and completely ourselves more joyful healthier, more prosperous, more happy in community. We are able to give the gift that we came here to give, the gift that is unique to each one of us. And there's a wonderful story from Kabbalah, or mystical Judaism, that, that talks about this idea. Uh, imagine that you're a master artist, and you have a very, you have a fixed amount of gold, which you've melted down, <coughs> and you're about to pour that gold into a mold that will produce a work of art that casts a magical light that will permeate the whole world and produce the highest awareness possible throughout creation. But as you pour this precious gold into the mold, it cracks and the gold runs out and disperses. And, and the only way you can finish this work of art is to go and collect all those flecks of gold that have scattered themselves all over. But as the gold spreads, the flecks split up and become smaller and smaller and smaller, and, and each one becomes surrounded by a shell of dust, so you can't even see the gold. All you can see is the dust. And since it's spread everywhere, the only way you can gather it together is to enlist other people, to employ the help of many, many others to collect it. The gold, of course, is the light of divine consciousness that's in each one of us. And each tiny particle of gold is what the Kabbalah calls a spark of holiness. A spark that, if gathered together with all the other sparks, would radiate ultimate awareness. But the only way this most sacred work of art, of awareness, can be finished is for each one of us to raise up the sparks of gold that we find, where we catch a glimpse under the dust and see a glint and raise that spark up out of its dust. And, and the only way it can be finished is for each of us to realize that everything we see, everyone we see, every rock and every tree and every plant and every animal and every human is a shell of dust that contains sparks of holiness. So our work is to recognize that the earth and shell is just that. All earth and shells are just that. That they are containers hiding, covering up this spark of divine life. And, and that to realize that in every moment, in every moment of our lives, no matter what, in every moment of our lives, we have the opportunity to raise those sparks up with loving kindness, with clear awareness, through living in harmony with the universe. And it's to recognize that our earthen vessel, too, is the container of the holy. And to raise up the sparks we find within ourselves, most importantly. This whole process is what the Kabbalah calls tikkun olam, the, the re restoration of the world. So as we raise these sparks of holiness through consciousness, we release them from their <coughs> shells of dust. And, and as we do our work from these seven truths of spiritual power, we are raising sparks all over the place, all over the place. And, and as more and more of them are raised and released from their shells of dust, we start to see a kinder world. We start to see more love in our lives we will ultimately see a world that works for all life. And that is our organization's vision statement. We see a world that works for all life, for everyone, for every plant, for every animal, for everything. 
And these opportunities to raise the sparks are boundless. They're boundless. Opportunities when we choose our activities, when we choose what we're going to watch on television, when we choose, as pointed out in the Kabbalah, what we eat, for eating is a sacred act, when we choose how we spend our leisure time, when we choose how we relate to one another, whether it's a business associate or a friend or a stranger. Everything, everything in daily life presents us with these husks containing sparks of holiness. And I love this metaphor of the, the gold poured into the mold and the sparks because it reminds me that it all counts. It all counts. I don't get to give myself a pass when I'm feeling cranky and the bag boy at the grocery store is slow. I don't get to give myself a pass when I feel like the speed police are out and those people in front of me clogging up every single lane doing 60 in a 70 zone. I don't get to yell at them. You know, I have to remember that they are containers of divine holiness. And I get to raise them up in my prayer and in my consciousness. I get to calm myself down and say, oh yes, even this moment right here, I'm confronted with the opportunity to raise someone up in consciousness and help them polish the dust off the gold that they are. It all counts. When I buy clothes, I think about the sparks they contain, the sparks that the people who made them contain, the sparks of the plants and animals that contributed to their making. All of these thoughts are opportunities to choose to live from these truths of spiritual power, the power of love, the power of oneness, the power to raise awareness in the world. Howard Thurman gave a wonderful um, graduation address one year, and he talked about this idea in terms of hearing the sound of the genuine within us. He said, there is in every person something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in herself. There is something in you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in you. Nobody like you has ever been born. And no one like you will ever be born again. You are the only one. If you cannot hear it, the sound of the genuine in you, you will never find whatever it is for which you are searching. You are the only you that has ever lived. And if you cannot hear the sound of the genuine in you, you will live all of your life. You will spend all of your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. I love that. If we don't listen for that deep voice of the genuine, of the power that is within each one of us, we wind up being pulled by the strings of the outer world, of the common everyday world. We get pulled into resentment. We get pulled into judgment. We get pulled into boredom. We get pulled into separation from one another, into, into that deep soul ache of loneliness. That deep voice says to us, look, look inside yourself and find that glimmer of gold. Look into the eyes of that person next to you and find that spark of holiness. Look into all that you do and see that it is, it is merely an earthen vessel for something powerful and beautiful. Speak to that glimmer in yourself and raise it up, watch it emerge and connect that glimmer, your glimmer, to, to the glimmer in the world around you and step into your own true nature, your divine nature. That's what I think it means to be spiritually reborn, is to just realize that we and everyone else, we and all life is all one. It's all the same. It is everywhere we look. This, this thing that is, that is within you, this, this genuine is yearning for connection, for expression, <clears throat> for connection with the divine everywhere, with the divine everywhere. And, and I read something that said that the yearning itself is its own answer because we follow our yearning for connection with the divine into connection with the divine. The yearning is its own answer. We, we connect by 
letting that spark of divinity within ourselves touch the spark of divinity within another or in an animal or a mountain or a flower or a lake or whatever it is that we see. And so when we start to view life through the lens of these principles of spiritual power, we will be drawn to some really countercultural ideas. So be prepared. Countercultural, because our culture is not one that prizes conscious awareness. It prizes prestige, money, possession, status, stature, status. One of the greatest examples I can think of is um, panhandlers. I don't know about you, but for a long time, I, um, I, well, I used to work with a guy who would berate panhandlers as he walked by them. I simply didn't look at them. And then I started to cross the street so I didn't have to be near them. And then something in me changed and I found a story um, that made me remember the sparks of gold that are there too. It's a story about the beggars at the Western Wall in Jerusalem, which is a holy, holy site. It is the holy site in Jerusalem. It's the, the, the Western Wall of the temple that was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Um, they're called Schnorrers. They have a special name, Schnorrers. And they solicit everybody for money, everybody who's there. Rabbi David Cooper, in his amazing book, God is a Verb, um, wrote about the Schnorrers, and he said that, you know, they, they were so continuous that, that he's been interrupted even when he was standing there with his eyes closed in silent prayer. So he just got used to carrying coins in his pocket and he would just pull one out and hand, hand it over. He wouldn't even open his eyes. Well, one day, a schnorrer came up, one of the schnorrers he, seen it, it, see, he saw every day that he was there, and Rabbi Cooper didn't have any coins. So he reached into his pocket and pulled out a 50 shekel note and said, do you have change? Well, the schnorrer reached into his pocket and pulled out a huge wad of notes. There was hundreds and hundreds of, of shekels. And Rabbi Cooper thought about what tourists would think of that, and he laughed. One of us would probably think, what gives here? This guy probably lives in a mansion, and he comes out here and scams tourists all day, right? Not true. Not true. What Rabbi Cooper knew is that this one man gathered up funds that supported two dozen families. He lived in a hovel, and he gave nearly everything that he collected over to these two dozen families who needed support. One tourist even complained to the rabbi. He said, you know, these schnorrers are arrogant. They don't, they don't seem to be grateful for what you give them. And I don't know, you know, here in the West, we seem to want our panhandlers to grovel a little bit, you know. The rabbi pointed out that the Talmud says, he who causes others to do good things is even greater than the doer. That's countercultural. That's mm -hmm. countercultural. There is no reason for someone who asks for help to feel abased or ashamed, particularly not when they are taking care of 24 other families. And that's the attitude with which the schnorrers come to their work, because what they do is, is beg so that mothers can stay home and take care of their children. This is really countercultural, you know? When we give 50 cents to a beggar or a panhandler, we usually think, I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm really good, aren't I? I'm really good. Mm. We want to feel good about it. We forget that the person who asked gave us the opportunity to feel good. We forget that, that you know, we have to give that person their due to honor them for providing us the opportunity they gave us countercultural. We're asked to remember that we're all one and to honor ourselves in the very highest way by remembering that the one who asks and the one who gives are one as well. And this is true when we need to ask for help. So many of us are so loath to ask for help when we really, really need it. We're giving an opportunity to someone to help us from their hearts. Maybe that will help those of you who can't ask for help. I know I'm one of them. You know, when, when, we, um, when we honor the sacred nature in each other by giving and receiving, whatever it is, love, 50 cents, a hand, help, 
a ride, a kind word, a smile. When we, when we give and ask for what we need, we're honoring that spark of life, that divine spark within each other. We are living from love. We're following what I call divine will, that part of us that knows that the, what, the person standing in front of us, no matter what, is a spark of divine life. We seek truth. We seek truth in the moment. The truth that this one standing in front of us is divine and has asked us, has made a great gift to us by asking <coughs> or by giving, if we're the one asking for help. All of these seven truths <coughs> that we've been talking about point to a whole way of being that's countercultural. Because it asks us to remember one really, really important and very countercultural thing. We belong to one another. We belong to one another. We do. Your joys are my joys, and my sorrows are your sorrows. Your giving is my receiving, and my giving is your receiving. When we remember that we absolutely belong to each other. We have the courage to act from that divine spark within us. We have the courage to honor ourselves and each other and the planet. We have the courage to be vulnerable enough to really act from love, to really ask for help when we need it, knowing that we're giving someone the opportunity to love us, to take the time to listen to what our deepest self is telling us in every moment, in every situation. There's a man named John Indermark. I have no idea who he is, but he said a great thing. He said, spiritual life and transformation are ultimately about coming down off the mountain and living the transformed life in places where fear runs rampant and love is in short supply. Amen. That's what belonging to each other is all about, I think. It's about gaining a little bit wider perspective, a little bit more expansive consciousness to come down off the mountain and, and live with what we've gained while we were up on the mountain. Live with what we've gained when we've been thinking about and living from and practicing these seven sacred truths of spiritual power. We remember that by doing that we have been reborn. We've been reborn into a more conscious version of ourselves. And we remember the sacred, sacred truths of our power and live transformed lives in places where fear runs rampant and love is in short supply. In other words, everywhere we find ourselves. Love is in short supply on this planet and fear runs rampant almost everywhere we go. So we can be bringers of belonging, of love, of the ability to see that spark in someone else and call it forth. And that's how we bring a new consciousness to the world. It doesn't happen, you know, I was reading in Rabbi Cooper's book, God is a Verb, about um, the Jewish concept of the Messiah, the Kabbalistic concept of the Messiah. And it is, it is not a person who's going to come and make the world over. It is the consciousness in every one of us that's going to make the world over. I think it was the Dalai Lama who said the next Buddha is not going to be a person. It's going to be all of us who bring greater awareness to life. Nobody else will do it. No one else can do it. It's only each one of us looking to raise up the sparks within ourselves and to raise up the sparks within each other and to raise up the sparks wherever we see them. It's only that that will bring a new consciousness to the world. It's only us, all of us who belong to each other, who can do it. So let's just close our eyes now and come together in conscious awareness. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out, deep exhale. And as you continue to breathe, realize you are breathing in spirit. Realize that you are breathing out spirit. Realize that you are spirit breathing. For there is only one. There is only God. 
There is only spirit, life, universal intelligence, filling all of space and all of time with its presence, filling each one of us with its love, with its wisdom, with its intelligence, with its compassion, with its infinite power, with its infinite health and prosperity, with its boundless and unconditional love. We are the beloved of God. And as I rest in that truth, I know that this is true of every one of us. It is true of every spark of pure divine gold that has spread itself throughout existence. So I know for each one of us that we recognize in a way greater than ever before that divine spark within us, that we raise it and praise it, that we, tr we try our best to recognize it in ourselves every moment of every day, so that when we look out we can, we can recognize it in each other. We can recognize it in nature. We can recognize it in all life and all existence. And when we see it, quote, out there, close quote, we remember that it is in here and we connect our spark with the spark that we see in the one in front of us. And in so doing, we raise, we raise a moment of the highest, most pure, most beloved consciousness. And in that moment, we raise the consciousness of our whole world. So I know for each of us that we just begin to do this naturally. We begin to participate more in this life to which we all belong. We begin to participate by loving it, all of it. By loving ourselves, all of us. By letting our consciousness our own individual spiritual power be our guide. Knowing this is the truth of us, I say thank you, God. Knowing this is the truth of our lives, that we are here to be all that we can be and raise all the consciousness that we possibly can, I say thank you, God. And from this place of deep gratitude, I release these words, knowing that the universe has already said yes to them. They are already so. And we say together, and so it is.